Welcome to season four of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we discuss business agility through customer experience, employee experience, and digital transformation. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. The Agile World Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed on this show, you can go to my website at gregkillstrom.com and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile Brand Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about creating a winning product roadmap to improve a company's innovation success rate. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Tony Ulwick, founder and CEO of Stratagen. Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, looking forward to talking about this subject with you. Uh, why don't we start, though, by uh, you giving a little background on yourself and what you're currently doing with Stratagen. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give you a, a little history. Uh, I started my career back in uh, the 1980s uh, with uh, IBM. I spent 10 years with them. And I worked on a product called the PC Junior that was uh, supposed to be IBM's entree into the home computer market and beat Apple and all those great things. And um, as it turns out, the day after we introduced that product, the uh, headlines in the Wall Street Journal read, the PC Junior is a flop. <laughs> and uh, and it was. Uh, and I, I wondered how IBM could spend all that time and money uh, creating a product that flopped. Uh, as, as it turns out, they're not alone. There's a lot of companies <laughs> that do exactly that. Uh, so that got me very interested in innovation as a process. And I spent my last five years at IBM trying to think through a better way to innovate. I started a strategy in 1991 with this innovation process that we've been refining ever since, uh, mainly in Fortune 500 companies, working with some of the smartest people around. So uh, we've made really good progress in, in de-risking the innovation process. What I'm currently doing is working on uh, creating a series of on-demand courses that will help companies uh, adopt uh, a different innovation mindset, which I think is critical to making headway uh, in this space, uh, and adopting a better innovation process, and also to really just build a culture of innovation. Great, great. Well, let's uh, let's dive in there to the topic of how to create a winning product roadmap to improve a company's innovation success rate. So I'm going to break this topic down into a few different areas, but first, uh, how do you define a company's innovation success rate and what are some of the primary reasons that companies are lacking in this area? Well, let's, let's start with defining what innovation is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because there's often confusion there, or there's just different views of what it is. So we define innovation as a process, and we say it's the process of devising solutions that address unmet customer needs. So um, given that, the goal of the innovation process should be to conceptualize a solution that you know with certainty is going to win in the marketplace before you even start developing that product. That would be ideal, right? And at the end of the innovation process comes the development process. But you want to make sure you're only only developing products that you know will win. So given that, success is really best defined as the percent of products that enter the development process that also win in the marketplace. So ideally, only products that are going to win in the marketplace will ever enter the development process to begin with. Got it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, to follow on to that, you know, what what are some of the reasons that companies are, are lacking in this area? And I think it's obvious that the goal of innovation is to devise a solution that address unmet customer needs. But oddly enough, most products enter the development process without a complete understanding of the customer's needs. And worse yet, the primary reason for the low innovation success rates is that and we've done many uh, studies on this, uh, amongst 90% of product teams, there isn't agreement on what a customer need even is. Yeah. So, so you have the sales team thinking about needs as features and solutions. You have the marketing team talking about them as exciters and delighters. You have the development team talking about them as specifications and requirements. You have other people that say customers can't articulate their needs. They have latent needs. They don't know their needs. Uh, so there's... Uh, you know, this issue is is really the, the the most difficult part to overcome in order to make innovation much more predictable. Yeah. So then, how do you define? You kind of touched on some of this, but how do you define a, a winning product roadmap? Uh, Greg, before we go there, I just wanted to cover one other. Point. Oh, sure, sure. So, yeah. okay, because product teams can't agree on what a need is, 
innovators are often forced to adopt the idea's first mindset. So products typically enter development before the concept is fleshed out and before product market fit is really well established. And we see this particularly in the lean startup world where innovators are asked to hypothesize the market, the needs, and the solutions all at once up front and then go test them in the marketplace as experiments. So this leads to experimentation, iteration, pivoting, all of which uh, you know, could be considered quite wasteful. So how do you define a winning product roadmap? Well, the way I like thinking about this is that we take the most efficient path to growth. Now, what this means is that you're you're always working on and taking the actions that will have the greatest impact on the largest customer population. I think about this as an, an efficiency thing where, you know, the goal is to know all the customer's needs, figure out the degree to which those needs are unmet, and the percent of the population that's underserved. And if you knew that, you could always work on the fewest number of things that will have the greatest impact on the biggest population. And to me, that's that's the most efficient path to growth. So, uh, of course, that's that's hard to do, right? And uh, and I think that's really the, the power behind the approach that we've developed is that it allows you to find that most efficient path to growth and to stay on it. Because uh, in most cases, your competitors are not on that most efficient path. And if you could just find that path and stay on it, you can get out in front of your competitors and stay there. Yeah, yeah. So what is the role of the customer and insights gained from the customer experience in achieving this winning product roadmap? Well, I think the customer insights themselves lay out that most efficient path to growth, right? You, you know, it begins with the qualitative research that's designed to define all the customer's needs, and then that's followed by quantitative research that's designed to uh, figure out you know, which of those needs are unmet, the degree to which they're unmet, uh, if there's segments of people with different unmet needs, and so on. Um, how about leadership? You know, what is the role of leadership in supporting the creation of this, this winning product roadmap since they need to balance many competing priorities? Well, they sure do. And uh, you know, they, they spend a lot on developing products, but there's very little typically, uh, certainly percentage-wise, it's spent on planning out the products. So I, I think the primary role of leadership is to fund the effort to complete the needs discovery work before products are conceptualized in, instead of after. And so let's invest in getting it right the first time instead of investing in experimentation and iteration and pivoting and so on. So I think the role then is is really to make sure the product teams have more of this needs-first mindset, you know, get the right inputs, know them up front, make the right decisions, uh, you know, build the right products and then build them right. right? Yeah. And, um, and then to know, uh, to make sure that people in the organization know how to use these insights to guide their decision-making process. So, you know, the sales team knows how to use these inputs to you know, better connect with, with their potential customers and marketing knows how to use the information to develop value propositions and content. And uh, the developers know how to use this to do their ideation work and come up with better product concepts. I, I think that's the real goal because uh, people are getting all their jobs done, if you will. They're developing products. They're launching products. They're just not the right products. Right? Right. <laughs> if, if we could only fix that one thing right, right. to make sure that the, the only thing that goes into development will be a winning product, uh, we'd really streamline the innovation process. And that's really you know, our thinking behind it. Yeah, yeah. So you are the inventor of the outcome-driven innovation or ODI process, uh, which you've referred to a little bit uh, previously and uh, have successfully implemented it at some leading organizations. Can you describe what outcome-driven innovation process is and what makes it unique from other processes that promise success through innovation? Sure, happy to. You know, I'd say in terms of what makes it unique, what we see in most companies today over 80% of product teams don't agree on the best way to define a market, a customer need, a market segment, an opportunity. And of course, that's the essence of what innovation is right. all about, is to pick a market, you know, figure out the customer's needs, figure out which are unmet, if there's segments of people with different unmet needs, and then go come up with the, the right solutions. So outcome-driven innovation brings clarity to this process by looking at the market through a jobs-to-be-done lens. And what I mean by that is it goes to the basic notion that people buy products and services to get a job done, right? They're not buying a quarter-inch drill. They're buying the quarter-inch hole. Right. So if we look at markets through that lens, everything looks a bit different. We can move from a 
product view of the world to a customer view of the world. And when you do that, uh, we can define markets differently. So for example, instead of a market being defined as a vertical or a geography or a use case or a persona, we're going to define a market as a group of people and the job they're trying to get done. So it could be parents trying to pass on life lessons to children or uh, interventional cardiologists trying to restore blood flow in an artery. You know, so it's a group of people trying to get a job done and they hire products and services to help them get that job done. And what that allows us to do is to include all job executors in the market, right? We don't want to define markets as personas or use cases up front because that's just a limited, That's a, you're already limiting your market. You're already segmenting before you even start. So yeah. we want to define the market very broadly. And then when it comes to defining customer needs, instead of defining them as uh, exciters and delighters or features and solutions or specs and requirements, we can define them as the metrics that people use to measure success when they get a job done. Like when you're cooking a meal, for example, you want to minimize the likelihood that the meal is overcooked or undercooked. You know, there's always a set of criteria or metrics people are using to decide if they're getting the job done well or not. And these statements can be designed in such a way that they quite literally instruct the innovators as to how to get the job done better. In other words, minimize the likelihood that the food is overcooked. If you can do that, you will get the job done better. Right? And that's really the goal of innovation. Let's come up with solutions that get the job done better, more cheaply, and we need to be able to define customer needs in a way that sets us down the right path. So defining them in this way uh, allows companies to go from a position where they don't agree on what a need is to they can agree on what all the customer's needs are. And that in and of itself is, is truly transformational. It, it also allows us to define opportunities differently. We're going to define opportunities as unmet needs. And unmet, by unmet, we mean important to customers, but not well satisfied. Or they could be unmet in the other direction too, where they're not important at all and way oversatisfied. So we would call that overserved. So with, with that information, you can figure out where the market's underserved and where to focus on value creation efforts and where the market's overserved and where to focus on cost reduction efforts. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, market segments. We can define market segments not around demographics or psychographics or personas or use cases. We can literally define them around the customer's unmet needs. That's really why we're segmenting to begin with. Companies use all these other approaches really as proxies to, to come up with segments that have different unmet needs, but these segments rarely have different unmet needs. Let's just go at it directly, right? Now, most companies can't do that because they don't agree on what a need is, what the needs are, or which are unmet. But once you solve those problems, now you can segment markets around the unmet needs. And with all the insight that I just described, then you can start devising solutions that target those unmet needs that are most underserved across the biggest population. So that, that's how you bring the efficiency to, to growth, right? Because you're always on that most efficient path to growth. You always know that you're working on the things that will matter most, right? Those needs that are most unmet across the biggest population. Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, give an example of how you've used ODI to help an organization innovate? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to uh, an example a number of years back where we helped Kroll on track uh, enter the uh, electronic evidence discovery business. So this was interesting because they had attempted twice and failed before they uh, came to us and and they were trying to figure out what they were doing wrong because uh, they felt they had a uh, an advantage because they're really good at extracting data off damaged hard drives. And so in the electronic evidence discovery business, which was just starting at the time, the, the thought was, let's take data off hard drives and you know then the legal team can go analyze that data to figure out whatever they want to figure out. And they were working with the same uh, end customers, the IT department. Now, uh, what we helped them do to figure uh, to fig figure out how to win was to first define the market correctly. They would define it using our terminology as IT people that were trying to extract data off hard drives. But that really wasn't the customer. The customer was actually the legal teams that exist in companies that were trying to find information that would support or refute a case. So this led them to think much differently about it. It wasn't all about just getting the data off the hard drive. It was making it searchable so you could find information that would support or refute a case. So once they realized that, they developed the techniques to make that possible. And that led to 
great success. So uh, you know, they they went from zero to three hundred million uh, in about five years, and uh, they were in the Garden of Golden Quadrant or Magic Quadrant for about fifteen years running as leaders in the space. And, and what I like about the story is that it it really took a long time for competitors to ca- to catch up because they were on the most most efficient path to growth. In other words, you know, they had a list of the customers' unmet needs in priority order, and there were about 60 of them. And in the first iteration of the product, they addressed about 25 of them at the top 25. And then the next iteration was another 5 or 10, and then the next iteration, another 5 or 10, and so on. So you could see them doing this, you know, release after release over the years, and no one could catch up because they were always focused on the next right thing to go create more value. And, you know, most of their competitors are sitting there going, well, we can't even agree on what a need is. <laughs> right, right. So I think that, you know, that lays out the difference between using an approach like this and just using traditional methods. That's great. That's great. Well, um, one last question before we wrap up here. Uh, as a fellow author, uh, I always like to ask about the process of writing. So in, in writing your best-selling books, uh, What Customers Want and Jobs to Be Done, Theory to Practice, what have you learned through the writing process and what advice would you give to those that haven't yet committed their thoughts to, to writing a book? Yeah, that's, that's a great one. You know, I, the first thing I learned is I am certainly not a born author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right there with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was uh, definitely a challenge, but um, I, I'd say the things that probably helped me overcome the challenge. Uh, the first thing it was really to, to work and rework the outline of the book until it was perfect. You know, so don't start writing content or any meaningful stuff until you've really outlined the book because it's really hard to keep in your mind where everything's going, right? And when you're writing a book, it's like you have to have the whole book in your mind the whole time you're writing any part of it. And um, you know, laying it out in an outline, I think, really helps. The other thing I found important is to be consistent with how words are defined and how they're used so that you don't confuse people by labeling the same thing in different ways as you're talking about it throughout the book. So you you don't want to burden them with trying to track down your language, right, yeah. and your definition. So keeping that uh, in mind, I think, is important. And uh, the last thing, which I'm not great at, uh, is to reinforce theory with examples. I love talking about the theory and how to put things into practice, but you know, I'm, I'm slow on uh, on laying out the examples, and I, I think that's. Uh, an important part of the the learning experience as well. Yeah, that's great, great advice there. Really, really appreciate that. Well, Tony, uh, thanks so much for joining the show. Uh, For those listening, what's the best way for them to keep up with what you're doing? Well, you can uh, come see what we're doing at strategen.com. We have a lot of materials around jobs to be done and outcome-driven innovation that are quite useful. Downloads, articles, white papers. Uh, I have a Medium site, jobs to be done plus outcome-driven innovation. That has um, a lot of my other articles on there as well. So there's plenty to search from. And there's uh, also a free book. It's an audio book version and ebook version that you can get at jobs to be done book.com with hyphens between jobs to be done book. Great. Well, again, I'd like to thank Tony Ulwick, founder and CEO of Stratagen, for joining the show. Thanks for listening to The Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom. Talk with you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.theagilebrand.show. To get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, visit my website at gregkilstrom.com. Until next week, stay agile.